lot to talk about, and we're talking about the future of senior living and where we're headed. Um, so, you know, I've been to so many of these conferences where we hear everybody high in the sky vision of what we should be doing in 10 or 20 years, and you're not quite sure why they're the ones who talk about it, why they have any expertise that you want to listen to. So, instead of just looking at the vision for 10 years from now, I want to kind of start one by one showing some of the expertise that's on stage today because each of them really has a, a lot to say and a lot that they're doing right now to pave the way for what senior living looks like in 10 years. Um, so Chris, we're going to start with you. You have stated that this is actually an overbuilt industry with expensive product uh, that the majority of the market can't afford. And so we're here, you know, how do we address this middle market? And what do the new models look like so that we can pave the way for affordability as well as profitability? Well, thank you for giving me the first question at 8 a.m. I'll try to keep it brief because we have an hour and we have a lot of great speakers on the panel. I, I think it, it, if you look at just the aging population, the silver tsunami that we've been talking about for the last 20 years, most baby boys are, are retiring with less than $200,000 worth of assets. It right, doesn't fit a lot of the, the buildings that I'm building and acquiring. And so how do you start to meet that population? I think also when you look at their choices and their tastes are changing, right? Um, my father's a great example. He's got a champagne taste on a beer budget, right? So how do you figure out how to meet that market? And then if we keep doing what we've been doing, we won't. Because if you look at, if, if Scott is paying $6,000 a month in an assisted living community. Jane's paying four. And Sebby, you're only paying two. No offense. You look more, much more affordable than two. But uh, you're only paying two. The cost ratio remains the same, right, no matter where you are. And it, that's not, it's become even more evident uh, after uh, COVID and the changes in wages, right? I know a caregiver is going to cost me that same amount no matter what these three people are paying. And so you can only save to, you know, so much. You can't push enough pennies around a plate to make it work. And so if people don't have the money, right, and we can't really do that middle, low income, my thought, this is my thought, uh, is that we have to change the model and go to more of a model that is a choice-based uh, add-on services where people can come in and get a nice apartment or cottage, you know, more of the active adult independent piece, and then have additional services where they can choose or use insurance or other payer sources to supplement that. To me, that's the direction we should go. Tom, um, you know, every industry has its life cycle. And you've been in the industry for a long time, 25 years, with uh, benchmarks, you know, 25 years in the industry, so certainly knows um, where we should be headed because you know where we've been. Um, but I'm interested in seeing in the life cycle where do you feel our industry is? We're seeing hospitality and uh, retail and healthcare all look at our space. We look at CVS and Apple and Amazon and they're all, they're, you know, Marriott, and they're, all, they're all vying for the space they're looking at us now. Um, what does this mean for us and what do you think, where do you think we're positioned in the life cycle and the lifespan? Yeah, it's an interesting uh, thing I've been thinking about for a while. about how industry, other industries are mature. Uh, they start with player or two, and then uh, over time, it's an experience that just happens. So you get um, other players in the field, you get um, insurance, you get a lot of those in the field, you get the consolidation of the market of the market for a while, and it's been very loose for our skill and not a friend to the field. But then you get things happening with the super road. Different segments of markets are starting to be getting different products. High end urban, fixed use urban, focus on the market, special niche products, including these other companies. Then consumer revolution is really maybe we call accelerate that a lot. I think that's a great thing. And the community output of those can be super living in terms of less efficient than its first look. More like that throughout the lives, all the same choices that you had in the adult years will start to be the adult years. Yeah, Tom, you know this. That, um, I've 
given keynotes on age tech for a long time now. And so in Silicon Valley for you know the last 12 years, I've said that the millennials, although that's an aging term, but all of the people who are building you know apps for the greater consumer market in senior uh, in, in Silicon Valley have really been looking at replacing the caregiver. And so how do you bring me my food, bring me my laundry, drive me somewhere? How can you replace mom? And mom has been the best caregiver in the world. So, you know, how are you taking technology and creating greater convenience, greater efficiency, changing your lifestyle? And there is, you know, that on-demand nature that we have, that immediacy, that personalization, the customization that we have is so important to us at every age. And so why are we not expecting it in the homes that we are aging in and, and the senior living that we're building for? Um, so I think you're right, the consumer is uh, shifting their expectation and we need to shift our product to be able to get to uh, where, to meet them where they're at, never mind, go get ahead of it um, when you're talking about the future. So hopefully the rest of the sound is okay for everybody. I'm sure we can all shout. Um, so, you know, I think that, um, I think, Sevi, you, you have an interesting history recently because you pretty much doubled overnight. So when we're talking about preparing for the future, how do you prepare for the future in the middle of such growth that you, you know, how do you get people, do you have, do you have a step back where you get people up to your standards and up to your brand and, you know, up to your expectations and then have to move forward? Or are you still able to plan for the future while you're doubling in size? I think everyone here, as a business owner or a leader in your business, knows that once it's public what's come out for your growth, you've been working years to make those things happen. And for every, you know, 10 buildings any of us have looked at either acquiring or coming in as a manager on, we've lost time to that. So you have to always have things in your pipeline. And, and that's for any sales cycle, right? For any type of client. Everybody's here to build business, right? Whether it is in acquiring, you know, new relationships with a, with a vendor partner or in acquiring new assets. It's all about revenue growth, right? And we're all trying to, like, replace the ones going out with the ones coming in. I think for us in particular during COVID, because it was a bit of a pause for growth for most of us, we found that when we were trying to take regionals who were at the building level and move them up into a regional position, nine times out of ten they didn't succeed. So we looked at it really internally and said, why aren't they succeeding? And what we needed, everybody knows you need to have a feeder, right? You want to have a feeder within your community for how you're you're, you're training people up to come into those leadership positions from the leadership positions at the communities, leadership support positions at your management level, right? So what we actually ended up doing was create these, like, step between positions that were more supportive roles that were more, they were supporting less communities than, uh, than a typical regional position would support. And we called them specialists. So what we did was it allowed a lot more, a, a longer training period of time for people to really step into and understand if a regional position was right for them. But it also didn't take them so far away from the day to day of what they're really passionate about with still working directly with the, with the residents, supporting the people that they've built those relationships in or, or garnered in to come into the communities. And then decide as they're not traveling the country going to different communities, perhaps they're just traveling regionally to the communities and that we've found over the last year is really what's helped set us up from a structural perspective because that's really what it is how do you grow your business and first I say well how many people does it take for you to manage one community and what does that cost so for me it was about going backwards to then figure that piece out so now we know fairly well and again that's going to change as everything continues to, to change as we're in our new normal but for us, it was really about making sure that we had the right support system in place to be able to add to that growth versus we've all done it. We've all bootstrapped it. We've all been out there doing it. Everybody's kind of got to fake it a little bit until you make it. Everyone on this stage, sometimes we're still doing it, we're building the plane as we're flying it. But, but really, I think during COVID, it allowed us that opportunity to really look and say, why has why this one succeeded and this one failed? And what part did we have in it? So building those step ups to make sure somebody was ready for the next the next step because some people are really great they can just lean right in and succeed and others 
they get a little bit too overwhelmed by the additional pressures or the additional responsibilities. And so having these specialists that work together as a smaller team, still supporting the communities, I think is what helped our success in particularly the Eclipse portfolio that we took over. And we've month over month um, continued to build occupancy, month over month continued to increase our revenue, and month over month been able to, to curb those expenses. So I, I, like, I attribute most of that to the way we built the team around it. Great, and I, I know you've been extremely employee-centric in, in your business strategy and your management style. Um, Jane, you're, you're similar in, in putting a lot of time and energy into employee development um, and, and really employee engagement. Can you talk a bit about what you guys are working on? Because I think it's pretty innovative and um, you have a, a pretty nice plan on how you're improving the, the development in, in, of your individual employees. So we trialed it in two buildings and we're, uh, we have 16 uh, employees enrolled in it. We, we branded it, so it's not called apprenticeship because no one knew what that meant. And uh, we branded it uh, Career Advancement Program. We marketed it. We have 16 employees on it now, and 14 out of the 16 have stayed past six months. And we actually got, uh, I think, about $18,000 through the grant. Um, so we're ready to rock and roll in other um, properties. It's been really successful for that. The other thing that we're, we're doing is how can we keep our culture and reinforce our culture and our, uh, regarding uh, who we are and how do we get to the employees fast? Because everything always had to go through the executive director and you would hope that they would share the information. So we got a platform. I'll give a big plug for Go Happy They're here. Um, and we're using that platform to help with employee engagement. We can do direct texts to, to, our, to our, all our employees. I can slice and dice it any, any way I want. And uh, even when you hire them, we're, you know, we're going to do a, a, we haven't started it yet, uh, but we're going to have a video that will go out automatically to every new employee when they get hired. So they start hearing the culture right from the start and that they're important to us. So we're continuing to focus on culture, and we know that good culture keeps people, good people, and good people take care of the residents, and, and NOI comes from that. It just is what it is, so. Yeah, and, and we'll dive into workforce in a bit, but first I want to talk to Scott for a second about, um, I think, you know, it's really important to look at the developer and the investor <coughs> it, it, as we're building for the future. And so what's, you know, what new builds are, are going to need to evolve here as we're looking 10 years from now? And, and you know, what, what are you building that, that's future-proofing? Well, you know, as, as Chris and uh, Tom were talking, uh, uh, mentioned earlier, that we've been talking about the silver tsunami to get here for 20, 30 years, right? And now that it's finally here, it's on the doorstep, womp. We've got this crazy recession. <clears throat> that's going on. It's, it's relevant to this discussion. When you talk about senior living in 2033, unfortunately, this, this, uh, uh, when you tie it in with new builds, um, this recession is going to have something to do with it. Presently, we've got 40 uh, assets across the country. We have four that are under construction, um, and uh, that's great. We're finishing those out. What we were looking forward to was the next 10, where we're going to do some pretty interesting things um, within the communities. And we had to make the heady decision, as have a lot of other private equity groups, to put that on ice. What does that mean? Get them to a point where they've got their approvals and then, you know, extend out the agreements with the seller. All that difficult stuff in order to do, achieve two things. One is we got to hit bottom with the Fed. In that, in, that, in that definition, it's like hit top, right? We've got to get to the point where interest rates are stopped, uh, have stopped being raised. We just took a huge hit on Wednesday. Powell um, mentions that we're not, you know, we're not at the top yet, mm. and that's going to impact. That's going to impact things. Now, the good news about that is, um, you know, all, all of our occupancies in our communities, the existing ones, are going to go up because there's no new supply. That's always a silver lining when you have these uh, these recessions. But it's it's also given us time to retool the uh, the mousetrap. Uh, to account for a lot of things we're going to talk about here at this uh, at this conference, which is a good things, but you know we're hunkered down. We, um, you know, as I said to my team, uh, you know, tough times don't last, but 
tough teams do. And so we've got to uh, get through this thing and, and, and wait for interest rates to come down. We gotta get out there and reprice um, out the construction of these, of these opportunities we've got in front of us because right now what we're building is gonna be so expensive that it's gonna drive the costs up for the consumer and nobody wants that. Old pencil. Yeah, it's a very interesting perspective and I think you know, we've all just come through the pandemic and now we have all of this economic uncertainty, but it's a resilient industry if, if nothing else um, and, and lots of leadership kind of forging the path through. Um, so I do wanna talk about the future of and what do we see in 10 years. Um, and I think we'd be remiss if we weren't talking about workforce. So we all, it's the big elephant in the room, the workforce is, is a challenge for everyone. Um, so I'd love to hear from each of you what you feel, um, you know, is the workforce of the future. What does it look like? And how are we attracting them or retaining them? Uh, you know, what, how are we attracting them into the industry and, and then and working with them? What, what does the workforce look like? Um, do you want to use this? Because I'm not sure yours works either. <laughs> uh, well, our recruiting criteria have recently included walking on water and parting the sea, uh, but that hasn't been very successful. Um, you know, clearly all, I think, presume all of us have been heavily focusing on diversity and equity initiatives given the changing composition of the population uh, and the importance of that uh, for a variety of different reasons. Uh, but that's clearly the, change, the coming composition of not just the workforce, but of leadership and uh, something that I, uh, I'm, all of us, I'm sure, are dealing with in our own ways. I think uh, uh, the, how, we, how we attract folks, to me, has always been, it's a multifaceted approach. It's not just compensation. Uh, to me, a large part of what attracts people to this industry has been our purpose, is why, is the calling that many people feel to get into taking care of elders, those that have this, uh, feel this calling in life to be nurturers and caregivers is still the most compelling reason why folks enter our field. So to the extent all of us can lead with that, I think that's the most compelling thing we have. And yet we can't do that if we're not also paying competitively and offering career advancement and good benefits and, and the like. Um, uh, so it's a multifaceted approach. I think our workforce is gonna, in the future, uh, gonna deal with all the realities that we're hearing about today. So. We're, I think, all hopeful for uh, improved immigration policies going forward. I think we're all uh, hoping for, um, and, you know, how, or planning for how we deal with y younger populations that are more tech savvy and have different expectations of how much they come to work and how we deal with those new dynamics. Um, but I think uh, uh, dealing with our, leading with our purpose is, I think, always going to be going to be number one. Uh, and I'm not sure what generation double A or double B is going to be all about, but uh, that may be beyond my time, but uh, it's going to be a challenge. It's, uh, I, think, I do think it's going to get a little bit better at some point in the future. The low unemployment now is so historically low that I guess I'm at least hopeful that when it eases a little bit, uh, it won't be quite as tight as it is today, but maybe that's my optimism. We need optimism. Um, anyone else, how are we attracting the workforce, retaining them, training? What does future workforce look like? I'll, I'll take a crack. I, I don't know what it looks like either, and I don't know what the generation is either, whether they're called the next one. But I, I think I'm always a, a proponent of you got to look at how we got here. And, and if you look at the history of how we got here, you know, we, we haven't done a great job of attracting people to this industry because of what Tom just said. I think we've used the purpose as the, the well, that people should want to work for us because we have you know, a great purpose in what we do, which is all true. But I think it's reframing how we look at how we attract people. And so if you think about the resident experience, right, they have to find us and they have to, you know, we have to generate a lead, they have to have a good experience, they have to research us and like what they see. They've got to come through and have a good experience, they show up in the building. We've got to make sure that we uh, give them a great tour experience, they, we follow up well, and then when they get into the community, we're going to make sure they have a good uh, brand experience, that value experience has got to play out. And we do all that for the residents, and we don't do that really well for, for team, right? And I think that's where we've got to change. We knew this was coming. We should all you know this was happening. Uh, COVID just exacerbated the, the headwinds that we're facing now. And so I think it really is about 
um, to all the things, some of the things Tom mentioned and uh, Jane and Sevi mentioned is how do we create a better experience and start treating team members like we treat prospective residents? And I'm not sure what exactly that looks like, right? I think we've got to, because this business is still a market-driven business. We cannot approach it from a 20,000 foot level, I think we're going to solve it. So each market, there's going to be nuances. And I think we've got to really dig into that, just like we do in, when we sell residents and sell their families. Um, and I think we have to appeal uh, to different generations, right? I think the baby boomers, they're not going to have any money, so they're going to need to work. So can we be in an industry where a semi-retired baby boomer comes in and does flexible work schedules and has flexible opportunities? And I do think, um, a plug to my twins who are turning 19 today, that generation does care. And so if they can have purpose, they'll work. It's not that they don't, they love what we do. I mean, that's the differentiator we do have. The silver lining in this is we do do something that makes a different uh, difference for the lives of the people we serve. But I think we have to sell that also with things that matter to a young workforce, like flexibility. Letting them have their cell phones with them because texting, not having it is like they can't fathom it, right? Adjusting, you know, we, several of us have made jokes about legalizing marijuana. Adjusting our drug testing policies are part of the future, right? We have to meet the workforce where it is, much like we're trying to meet residents where they are. And if we keep talking about it and not doing anything, we'll be sitting back up in this panel. I hope not in 10 years. I hope there's some other people sitting in the panel. But we've got to really adjust. And so it's going to take some real work on the operator end the investor end, right? We're gonna have to collaborate to figure this out because there are not enough people to serve the people aging into our customer bank. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. And I think that, you know, finding the, the real answer to this question is, is the magic bullet for this industry because you have mm -hmm. to do it all within a, um, a cost framework that works, right? And uh, we've got <clears throat> two significant holes that we've got to dig out of, uh, that, we are gonna, that we are digging ourselves out of. One was during the pandemic, you had 3.1 million seniors who called it quit, who retired. I can call it quits. They said, okay, I've had enough. That's it. Think about that. That's a huge chunk of your workforce, but it's also the ones that are the, they have the gray around the temples like I do, and they've got uh, all these great experiences. They're super reliable, super conscientious, um, you know, great folks to have on your, on your team. They're gone for the most part. Some of them are coming back now that we've got a recession going on. And we're just about to leave a, in my opinion, I think we're going to leave a democratically controlled Congress mm -hmm. where, which was not able in two years to get an immigration bill passed, which is, you know, a big part of the solution, opportunity lost there. So how we, how we uh, solve this issue is, is really one of the things I want to get out of this panel, out of this, uh, out of this conference. One of the things we did really well during COVID is we all band together and shared information. And it wasn't, oh, this operator had bad press and we're just going to be like, oh, yeah, right, they're so bad, right? Like, you should come to our building because of that. And I hope that we continue to, to support one another. I mean, there was some recent bad press with one of our fellow operators and literally it could have happened to any one of us. And in fact, after starting to talk to other operators, it has happened in many instances. It just wasn't picked up by the press. I think that in the next 10 years, if we don't do a better job recruiting throughout the industry and not trying to say, that's my competitor, we have to change our viewpoint. I, I don't feel like I compete with any of you on this stage. Because I think that when we all know what we do well, and somebody comes to one of our communities, whether it's an employee or it's a resident, if they're not a fit for us culturally, then we need to help find the right fit for them in another one of our communities. It doesn't make somebody a bad employee because they don't fit with my family culture and hugging. It just means they don't fit. The same with a resident. And what happens is we try so hard, I think sometimes, or at least historically, to hold on to people and try to make that square peg fit into the round hole. Whereas if we were marketing for our industry from an employee perspective as well as from a resident perspective, we're going to retain them. Otherwise, what's going to happen is we're going to end up being the blockbusters. And because we're only fighting with each other to have that one person, and instead of keeping them within the industry, this is why it's important that we come to these conferences. There's nowhere else for two days where we're going to have the ability to have this many meetings. Not one of us could do that successfully and, you know, still have our wits about us by having that many people walk into our office. So, like, I thought Gary Jones, like, 
set it up the best from VCPI last night. And he challenged us to like do something that you wouldn't do. Meet somebody that you wouldn't meet. Learn something new. And that's how I think as an industry we move forward into the next decade. We have to think differently. We can't think that it's bad for growth to continue to happen and say, oh, we can't do it because that's how we started it, right? Tom's saying nobody has successfully, you know, gone above 120 buildings. We can't think like that. And we can't think that, oh, well, this person is a terrible employee because it didn't fit with us, and this resident's a terrible resident because it didn't fit with us. How can we keep everything in the family and continue to support each other so that we grow the right way? Thank you. Um, so each of you have talked you know, about workforce changes and new models and, and certainly innovation in different ways. Um, let's talk a bit about what uh, the role of technology plays in the future of senior living. We're about to meet with many, many vendors here who um, have great solutions, tech-enabled solutions often that deliver things in a, in a different way than we're delivering them today. So what does technology, what role does technology play in the, in the future? I know, Tom, you're really committed to technology, so why don't you start? Well, I think technology is I don't think anybody would disagree, going to play an indispensable role in senior living in the future. Um, uh, I'm not sure if that was an editorial comment from the back. Or, um, <laughs> he agreed with you, Tom. Uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, a lot of what has happened in the early years in senior living has been what I'd call a lot of gadgetry. And I think as the industry matures, we're starting to see more appropriate and more helpful technology come. Uh, one big problem that remains is interoperability, uh, the lack thereof between, on the software side in particular, but uh, not just limited to the software side. But I think that the opportunity remains still for a lot of the technology entrepreneurs to really, really understand what the operator's needs are and to develop things in response to those, um, uh, while also perhaps offering their own ideas about things that they think <coughs> operators' needs are, um, and I think there, there continues to be a lot of things that I get solicitations for uh, that are somebody else's idea that don't really address what our needs are, uh, and so there are some great technologies out there. Technology is undoubtedly going to be a key to both improving efficiency, to improving our associate experience, to improving our resident experience, to improving, you know, everything. Uh, but I think it's still, in my view, a relatively, I don't know, we're sort of in maybe the teenage years or something like that mm -hmm. in terms of adoption and maturity in our industry. And I'd love to be further along and be able to adopt more and have it be more seamless and more um, uh, at a higher, at a greater level of efficiency and so on than we are today. Uh, but I think technology is going to be huge and we're continuing to adopt more and more, but I think perhaps a little bit more slowly than others because we're wanting things that are uh, that are proven and hopefully interoperable and can really absolutely deliver improved associate experience or resident experience or operating efficiency. You know, I think technology the last couple of years has stalled a lot. And I think the reason why is we had so much challenge with staffing, getting the communities to use it, and I think, I mean, there's so much good stuff out there, but you layer on platform after platform to the executive directors, and it's too much, and they can't, they can't manage it. So you've got to find technology that takes the burden off the building, because if we have to rely on them to execute it, you're going to have great programming technology that talks with the families, but someone still has to enter the information, someone still has to do all that. So the more technology that's available that says, this is automated. You don't have to do it, it integrates with your system, it pulls from your payroll system, it pulls from your, your you know, electronic medical system, and it's, it's automated. And if you could do that, that's gonna be the win. But just adding more technology, it, it fails. And it's expensive, and, and, and you know, with all respect to all the vendors, they're like, well, it's only $500 per community per month. Well, add that up with another 12 technologies. So, um, you know, it's, it's going to be challenging. 
And that's why taking it slow and making sure it works, but the minute you lose an ED or a, an HWD, a nurse, it doesn't work for three months. Yeah. So. I agree. I agree that technology has stalled, but it's not going away. And I think it represents the biggest threat to seniors housing right now. And what I mean by that is the technology is going to get so sophisticated that staying at home is going to is is for as we all know is a big competitor of ours. It's going to get even greater as much as, as so many things can be monitored from a home situation. That's the good news. You know, it's uh, we want to take care of seniors first and foremost, and now we've got a, a bunch of tools that. Um, you know, that a lot of it we don't even know about by the time we hit 2033. Uh, it's like I was watching um, the YouTube on Steve Jobs when he introduced the iPhone in 2007, and it was like a really, you, know, it, you guys should check it out, it's like 10 minutes long. It's really cool because it, everybody's so excited about it. They know this is a big thing, a huge thing, um, but it's, you compare it to what we've got today, it's actually crude, and that was just a really short time ago. Um, so we've got technology that's, uh, uh, and, and it takes many forms in health monitoring, uh, systems monitoring, um, levels uh, within, the, within the body. You've got artificial intelligence is going to be a factor, virtual reality. All these things are going to play into it. Um, the one thing that a lot of the, the, the technology still does not have, which is our ace in the hole, is, is the sense of community. And I think that that's what we're going to have to find a better way to figure out how to embrace and promote as we go through this next decade. So I'm going to disagree with you, my friend. Oh, nice. So I think that technology is actually how we attract people to our communities going forward. I think that the technology that's coming forward isn't going to keep anybody home any longer. I think that the pandemic has really solidified the type of services that we offer and why we are so needed. Now, I think that we can offer better, more monitored technologies as they continue to evolve, more passive technologies at a less expensive cost in our communities because we can do it in a congregate setting. I think that it would be too difficult going forward in the future for individuals to be able to do that as well as we just are so far away from any AI really providing hands-on care. And that's not changing anytime soon. So I just think that, I think technology is what's, gonna, is what's actually going to change the dynamic of our communities and what's going to attract people into them versus keep them at home. Can I, can I add something to that? Yeah. Because so, I'm, I'm going to kind of agree and disagree with both of you in some aspect. Um, <laughs> In, and I'll start from the to the current state to future state. We'll talk about both. There's so a lot to unpack here. Uh, current state, we are an industry that's under-resourced, under-capitalized. Um, we, we don't have enough people to take care of people who live in the building. We don't have enough money to pay. We just talked about wages going up, margins compressing, cap rates going up, or, or interest rates going up, causing uh, less cash flows, less ability to, to make these uh, businesses pencil and, and do well from a profit standpoint. So then you layer technology into that. So I always just, in the current state, there's a lot of, and I appreciate all the vendors here, and there's, you're always very passionate about what you bring, and it, it could make a difference. I mean, we don't deny, and I think sometimes we as operators get a bad rap because we're like, no, we can't do it, or we don't have time, or we can't launch that initiative. Jane said something, we cannot overwhelm. I think sometimes we get perceived as the end user decision maker. I am not. It is the ED at the community, it's the director of wellness at the community, it's the caregiver at the community. Technology that helps enhance their experience helps us solve some of the staffing issue and also um, helps us kind of figure out how to meet them and, and help them do their experience better. And so interoperability is important, but you got to think cost because we're already struggling with cost. And if I have to pay, a, if I have a choice of paying a caregiver, because let's face it, robots can never do what we do. Like I always see the robot company, I hope no one's not here. I, it just, it's not, we need to be able to put hands on people, right? That's what we do. And so if given the choice of a person over technology, I got to take the person every time. So we have to figure out how we find those technologies that let us enhance that personal experience from a cost perspective. And then let's figure out how are they user friendly, right? Can that end user actually use the technology and make it work? I've had some great technologies in buildings that are so complex, no one can use them. The, the team, it takes them days just to, to, to maintain the system, let alone use the system. So you have to think about that. Future state where they agree and disagree. I do think technology is going to disrupt our industry because people will, whether they're right, wrong, or indifferent, will say, I'm going to stay home because I can get Uber Eats. I can do this. I can have someone come into my house. 
I think the difference is a little bit what Sebi's saying is the model's gonna shift. If we keep offering three meals a day and bingo, bus rides, and balloon toss, the horrible bees of assisted living, we're not gonna get anybody. <laughs> they're, they're gonna stay home. If we can bring a different model where we give more choice and tech is part of that choice, we will attract people into our communities. But if we keep doing what we're doing today, none of us will be here in 10 years. We'll yeah, be dinosaurs. Savvy, this is one of those instances where I, I, I hope I'm wrong, but as we both know, in our discussions, I'm rarely wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> just kidding, just a little yoke there. Um, but uh, yes, but socialization is, is under threat. We see, it, we see it every day, we see it with our kids. Kids who would rather lose their wallets and their keys over their, over their cell phone. Mm -hmm. That's something that's, you know, how do you change that? You don't. you got to figure out a way to embrace it. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I'm also going to agree and disagree with some of you, but start with Chris because you can handle it. <laughs> um, uh, so I do think robotics plays a huge part. Now, I understand that, um, you know, robots replacing us is a, is a different story, but lately I've been deploying in my consulting um, it, robotic food delivery and it's yeah. been really game changing for the workforce because we had someone in a community that I was in where we added this uh, robotic food delivery from um, you know to, to bust the tables and we were able to keep someone in the workforce who was 65 who couldn't handle the six miles per shift that was going back and forth to the kitchen and now we're looking at actually better hands-on customer service, engagement with the residents while the robot is doing a piece of the job. So can we look at task segmentation? Can we look at automation in different ways where robotics is applied to supplement and augment the workforce? I believe yes. Um, and, and I know you weren't saying That's no fair. to that. That's I take that. That's fair. <laughs> um, and I will agree with you that people need to understand the purpose behind technology. Technology for technology's sake never works. Um, in, I led global innovation for Genesis Healthcare for years, and um, we designed an innovation center that was uh, tech connected into the community. And um, we had so many different technologies that we trialed in both China and in the U.S. And you know, we had a board decision to invest in a company that then pushed down advanced directive automation. And the cost savings was going to be amazing. And the uh, lack of return to the hospital if we were following, following advanced directives was going to be wonderful. That's never going to work when the end user is the caregiver and they just care about the resident. They don't care about the money you are saving. And so if you look at technology, it's also about educating, implementing, and supporting the workforce so it's not this additional burden. It's not uh, without purpose and without meaning. And you're taking the technology and understanding you are honoring a person's end of life wishes when they can't speak for themselves. That is the message. So it is how we reframe technology and it is how we reframe our education and support of technology in order for it to succeed. Um, so I'll, I'll wrap up because I could obviously geek out about technology forever. Um, but I do want to ask one closing question of everybody. Um, and if we're looking at future-proofing this industry, if you were to throw one thing out that we do now, we don't have to debate it, but just tell me, what would you get rid of? What are we doing now that is so antiquated, but we keep repeating it? What should you, we throw away? And what is one thing we have to do right now in order to prepare for the next 10 years? Want me to leave? Go ahead. Yeah. Three meal, a, three meal a day dining with an alternative choice. Right? I mean, it's the most unchoice dining experience you could ever have. What was your three Bs, did you say? Oh, balloon, ball toss, and bus rides. And, you can put and bingo, in too, you right? Bingo, yeah, you can put all in there. Mm, that's, that's, <laughs> I can double that's credit, my, all right. I think we should just get rid of the staffing uh, uh, schedules. 7 to 3, 3 to 11, 11 to 7, because that's the way we do it, and with, we've always done it. And if we don't change that, we're not going to attract new staff. We have to figure out a different way of staffing. God, there's so many. I feel like there's so many things about our industry that can... I think that capital needs to be more involved on the understanding of the operation side of things. I think that they've, as a, as a result of COVID, they've come to understand 
a little bit about it, but I don't think that they're quite there in the pressures. Like, I think they take like one report that somebody puts out and is like, oh, great, everybody's margins are back and why aren't you doing this without really understanding if they don't live up to their side of the bargain in terms of putting the capital in, giving us access. When they deny the capital, the strain that it actually puts on the buildings, like capital has to be a bigger part of understanding what we're doing. Uh, I would say stop thinking about senior living the way that we have. Period. Period. Yeah. Mic drop. That's a mic drop. Yeah, that's a great mic drop. <laughs> um, well, I know Jane lit up on that uh, the capital provider <laughs> comment because she's walked away from deals because they're not the right provider of capital because they're not aligned with the mission. So I think you know, getting rid of the wrong partners and the wrong approaches, it's, it's um, tremendously challenging, but very important. Um, so, okay, what, what's one thing we need to do right now? What do we need to invest in time, resource, energy, attention? What do we need to pay attention to to be prepared for the future? I'd say better understanding our customers at a much more detailed, granular, and uh, overall level than our industry does today. I think we have to work together as an industry, whether it's recruiting and retaining employees throughout the industry, maybe not just in an operations setting, but maybe at a tech platform, maybe you know, at, at, a, at a supportive industry. And the same with our residents. We need to be more transparent with our residents about what the costs actually are before they even step foot in our buildings so that they can be prepared for something they can afford instead of us trying to say, don't worry about the cost, just come in and see it. I mean, none of us go look at a house without knowing if we can afford it. I think we have to understand the employee better and what they want. I mean, it's great, you know, we, we got to understand what the customers want, but if we don't have the employees to take care of them, we're just going to be spinning. We'll have a great looking building that's innovative with technology with no staff. So I really think we need to understand what, what it does and then actually ha have the ability and, and the, the courage to do something different. Um, I th you know, generally I think we're doing a pretty good job. If you think about it, this in industry didn't is exist 50 years ago. It was either um, mom or grandma was in the back room or in um, the hospital, right? And now they've got these wonderful um, communities where they're living longer, happier lives because they have better nutrition, preventive health care, they're socializing, all these great things that are going on in these communities. So that's uh, awesome, and everybody here should feel proud about that. Uh, as far as um, where we go in the future, I, I do think that we're in our infancy of our federal government understanding what's going, what's going on, what this industry is like, and, <clears throat> and how costs should be shared with the, uh, with the uh, programs that we've had, we've had since the, since the mid-40s. The mid um, I think that that's a real tough thing, and that certainly is the answer to the thing we haven't discussed, which is the middle market. Uh, it, this is a very expensive business. You know, it, it, I'm preaching to the choir here, but... You know, running a community on a day-to-day -day basis, you're, you're running a, 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 a care community, you're running a, a hotel, you're running a restaurant. Um, it's very expensive to do that. That's why it's the, 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 the costs are so thick, so high. The fixed costs are so high. And until that gets um, resolved, it's going to be really tough to address the, uh, the middle market. So my one thing today would be uh, let's start value, valuing the employees, the people, as much as we value our residents. Really start doing it for all of us, operators, vendors, uh, equity partners, uh, because if we do that, then I think we'll start thinking a little different and we'll start really attracting people. Thank you, guys. Um, I know Bob's going to talk about the middle market in his talk later, so I think we'll uh, address some of the nuance of middle market with, with Michael and Bob at his session. Hopefully you can join that. Um, and thank you so much. I hope you all learn something new and meet someone new, as Gary has said. And thank you, Michael, for having us. Yep. Thank you, guys.